even a Bible bomb. But for the most part, let's keep the drawbridge closed. That's not Daniel. That's not the community in exile. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Can I introduce you to someone special? Because we, we've talked about the theory. Can I introduce you to somebody? This man's name is Tony Bennett. This is not the, the smooth singing jazz artist that uh, left my heart in San Francisco. Tony Bennett and I became good friends and he's had a lasting impact on my life. He's the coach at Virginia, Virginia Cavaliers. If you follow college basketball, you'll know that he has the number two team in the country right now. Tony Bennett played in the NBA for the Charlotte Hornets from 1991 to 1994. He was an All-American at Green Bay, Wisconsin. He still to this day holds the record of the highest three-point percentage shooter in college history. He came to New Zealand in 95 and 96. We had just arrived. He was there to rehabilitate his knee as he played for the Sydney Kings because the off-season of the NBA is in Australia. So Tony and I met when he came through New Zealand on his way back home to sign a $3.3 million contract to play for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Tony and I became good friends. Tony often talked about how much he hated the travel of NBA life and he had just been married and wanted to spend more time with his wife. So I saw that as an open door and I gave him a challenge. I said, Tony, maybe the Lord wants you to stay here with me and help plant a new church in a nation that's 97.3% unchurched and the fastest growing religion in New Zealand is no religion. And I had him over to our home and we didn't have any furniture in the house yet so I drew our vision on the back of a Pizza Hut box. And I shared it with Tony and his wife. Tony said, Jeff, let me go. I need to go home. I need to go back to the U.S. I need to think about this. There's a lot to think about. You know, I have a lot of opportunities. I said, okay, I'll be praying. About six weeks later, I'm downstairs in my garage in my office. And do you remember those old brother fax machines? I'm typing up this week's sermon on an old Apple computer. And the fax machine starts going. And it was a photo of Tony Bennett on the top of the stack of players after Alonzo Mourning had just hit a shot at the top of the key at the buzzer to defeat the Boston Celtics in game seven. And Tony sent me this picture, only he wrote a caption on the bottom of it, and it said this, Pastor Jeff, what I did here was but for a moment, what I'll do with you will be through eternity. And he gave up $3.3 million for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he spent three years in New Zealand helping us plant the church. Why? Because Tony's life is much more about the kingdom of God than anything else. Last week, I traveled to Virginia to spend some time with my friend Tony. He is now the coach of a university that is probably one of the more liberal, secular, anti-God universities in America. Tony's five pillars with his players are all based on scripture. Passion, humility, servanthood, unity, thankfulness. When they won the ACC tournament, the first time since the days of Ralph Sampson, since 1982, the crowd went crazy at Virginia and they stuck the microphone in Tony Bennett's face and they said, well, how do you feel? And before he had a chance to think, he said this, I just want to thank Jesus Christ for sustaining me through all the adversity. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I want to thank Jesus for helping us give the victory over our opponents. No, I want to thank Jesus for sustaining me through all the adversity. The Christians at Virginia went crazy, but the next morning, all the atheists on campus started to blast Tony and say, how could you do that? How could you bring God into it? Why can't you leave him out? And Tony's response was this. He took those names and he put them at the top of his prayer list of everyone who emailed and gave no response and just kept doing what he does best, salt and light the city on the hill. What he's been able to do at that university is uncanny. The AD, athletic director, is a Christian. The football coach is now a Christian. There are Bible studies happening all over the University of Virginia that he's not launched or started. He's just inspired them. 
because of the way he behaves on the sideline with such character and integrity. We went to a game as they defeated Wake Forest. We had tickets right behind the bench. That's what happens when you're a friend with Tony Bennett. <laughs> I looked around, and I have never been in a more civile environment at a basketball game in my life, and I've been to many. I even heard one of the students say to the official, Sir, I think that was a bad call. <laughs> That's as violent as it got. Now it got loud. It got loud and demonstrative, but it was respectful. When they announced the starting lineup for Virginia, the crowd cheered. But when they said, coached by Tony Bennett, the place erupted. All because of this quiet man who loves God and who has refused to assimilate, who has refused to separate, but has permeated the culture of a secular university, and they love him. What would happen? What would happen if every Christian took their circle of influence and did what he's doing? I think of my friend Mike Masterson, who owns Isotech, the fastest growing pest company in California. I should say pest control company. He probably wouldn't appreciate that. And how he has devotions with his staff and talks to them about Christ. I think of my friend Jack Lansford, who owns one of the top furniture companies in Southern California. How he prays with those who work for him. I think of my friend Malene Hancock, who's just a school teacher, just a school teacher, but has the influence over so many kids. We will never be able to live in the city of man until we truly understand the heart of God. So can I ask you, why are you here? Is it because you want to win debates? Is it because you want to appear to be the smartest person in the room when the conversation starts going down the line of religion and worldviews and faith systems? Or is it because you truly love people and you truly love God and you want to bring the two together? If that's why you're here, you've come to the right place. I asked my friend Tony, Tony, how do you deal with the pressure? He says, I get with my chaplain. And I kneel on the ground in my office before every game. And I pray that God would give me peace. And I pray that he would remind me of my real purpose. What is your real purpose, Tony? To bring everything and everyone far from God near to God. Really? It's not championships. It's not to make another million dollars by making the playoffs or winning the Atlantic Coast Conference. No. Bringing people who are far from God near to God. History has always been about God's redemptive Reimagination. Do you realize? Now, this is the end. Stay with me. Do you realize what God is saying in Jeremiah? He says to the people, It was part of my plan that you lost your cultural power. It was part of my plan that you're living in a pagan, wicked city. We forget that you and I have been bought with a price, that we are owned by God for His purposes, and His purposes come to fruition. God reserves the right to send you and me into captivity that we may show the world what it is like to be the people of God. He says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now, please listen. I hear a lot of negative talk on talk radio and in newspapers and sometimes by Christians. Okay, most of the times by Christians in this context. Please listen. This is not the time to fear and panic. This is not the time for pessimism and slander. It is not the time for separation and assimilation. This is the time to assume that God has brought us to this time and this place to achieve his great purpose. It is the time to reimagine what God can do in the middle of our captivity based on what he has done in the past. It is time for every pastor to ask himself or herself, am I leading a movement of separation Am I leading a movement of assimilation or am I leading a movement of permeation? It is time for every genuine, serious Christ follower to stand up, stand out, stand for the peace and prosperity of the city to which God has called us. It is time for God's people to reimagine themselves as people used by God as an agent for the renewal of all things to bring those who are far from God near to God. 
and ultimately, and ultimately understand that God does his best work in the worst of circumstances. Yes, even in captivity. Just quickly. I have a friend, Ajay Law, that I talk to often. I sat down with him recently. His pastors are literally turning northern India right side up with the gospel. His pastors are torched, beaten with iron rods, dipped in hydrochloric acid, raped and tortured. I said, how can we pray for you? And here's what Ajay Law said. He asked his 70 pastors that graduated from his seminary that question. He sent me a message and said, Jeff, here's what they asked me to tell you. Don't pray that the persecution will end. Pray that we will be brave and courageous enough to endure it. This is how the kingdom grows. The gospel does not permeate a culture without tension and straining and even suffering. For six years, I've been going to the prisons of Rwanda. Six years to preach to those who are still there responsible for the genocide of 1994. Those who orchestrated and fashioned the events together. My friend Edistas Sababungu, the last time I went, said, Pastor Jeff, you've come here five years in a row. I'm going to take you to a high secure prison, but you need to do what I tell you to do. We get in a truck. We leave the city of Kilgali. We drive three hours into the mountains on the border of the Congo. And the whole way, Anastas is saying, Pastor Jeff, remember, this is different. You do what I tell you to do. You speak when I tell you to speak. You stay between me and the prison wall. You see the warden. We leave. We speak. We arrive. We speak. We leave. That's it. You got it. We're about to come into the iron gate. And I look at Anastas, who's my friend. And I say, Anastas, just before we go in, am I in any danger? And Anastas looks at me with a smile on his face, as, looks like an old ambassador, and he says, Pastor Jeff, does it matter? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a wife and three kids. Uh, no, I got two. I just had one just a few minutes ago. Yeah. I got a wife and two kids. And Anastas, in his own personable way, because we had developed relationships, said, it's interesting that you Americans are all willing to do ministry as long as it doesn't cost you anything. In Africa, in my years there, I noticed that when suffering or captivity occurs, their first question is usually this, what great thing is God going to do through this? In the West, our first question is, why has God abandoned me? In Acts chapter 5, we're told when they suffered, they were rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And the Greek word worthy is the word axios, which means to bear the weight. And it means basically this, when the first church suffered, do you know what their attitude was? God Thank you that you trusted me enough to think that I could bear this weight and not leave my post. The question is not, has God abandoned us? The question is, will we abandon him when he needs us the most? Our cross, Christ's cross, is the center of our faith, right? Which proves again, it is possible to be in the absolute worst time of your life and be directly in the center of God's will at the same time. And so God says to his people, you're living as believers in an unbelieving world. It's part of my plan. I designed this. Move in there. Don't stay away. Permeate. Show them what it's like to be the people of God. Let them see your holiness and purity and your grace and your mercy and your kindness. Let them see your determination to make this place a place of prosperity. The greatest apologetic, folks. The greatest apologetic. You're going to hear some great speakers. My time is up, so I've got to be quick. Which for a pastor means I've got about five minutes of conclusion left, right? You know that. <laughs> You're going to hear some great speakers. These are some sharp men over here. But they will tell you, and my experience in New Zealand taught me, you, you need to be ready with an answer in season and out of season. It's not an either or, it's a both and. You need to have some answers to engage our community and our culture. And when I began to develop those answers and be able to explain in simplicity, yet with clarity, what I found is that these are the type of men that helped me break down the barriers and the walls so that they could look into the windows of my life and see the message of Christ. Apologetics is important because it helps us break down the barriers. It's not an either or. It's a both and. It's answers with a gentleness and love and passion, and it's a life well lived. But make no mistake, your greatest apologetic will always be the way you live your life. And if people believe that you're there to make the city prosper, are you? 
I hope that we will always remember Jeremiah 29. Don't separate. Don't assimilate. Permeate. The power of discussion and compassion and through a life well lived. Evangelism is never going to improve from a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Discipleship will never improve from a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And if you will invest in people around you, it doesn't matter what's going on in the outside world. The church is like a mustard seed. It will grow and grow and grow from the inside out and will explode. And the world will be a better place. And we will be able to give people hope where there is no hope. If we will just obey. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you and praise you for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. I ask you right now that you would open our eyes to the truth of our calling. That you would forgive us of times that we've used language like them and us. That we would have an understanding that it is not your desire that anyone should perish, but that all may have everlasting life. Open our minds now. Give us clarity of thought as we hear some fantastic speakers. Help us to learn things that we had not previously known. Help us to take it deep in uh, to our testimony and our witness as we share the good news of the gospel and every good thing associated with it to those that you love, that we love, that the city and the world may prosper in Jesus' name. Amen.